Hello, everybody, and welcome to Daytona International Speedway. It's the first IMSA main event of 2020's season that will stretch from now here in Florida in January all the way to October. Uh, just, well, not too far away, eight and a half, nine hours drive, I suppose, from here at Motul Petit Le Mans at Road Atlanta. In between, we'll cover the length, breadth of the United States and head up into Canada, of course, as well. And sometime around about that final race, we will be crowning champions in the Inverse Weather Tech Sports Car Championship in both the full season and the Endurance Championship as well. Good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is, welcome to the biggest sports car community on the planet. It's IMSA Radio and IMSA TV together live from our IMSA broadcast centre just over the start-finish line on the tri-oval here at the World Centre of Racing. Joining us here in the IMSA Radio and TV booth, Jeremy Shaw and Johnny Palmer. Our pit lane reporters are Shea Adam and Jamie Howe, and I'm John Hindorf as we get ready for quick-fire qualifying action, 15-minute sessions. It's pretty much settle down, ring the bell, and get your elbows out, get on the track, get your time in, and that's going to set your grid position for the weekend running of the 2020 Rolex 24 at Daytona. And it's all live here on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Uh, let's find out who is going to be qualifying in GTD. We'll start uh, with Jamie Howe. Good afternoon, Jamie. Good afternoon, John. Much more enjoyable now the rain has decided to stop for the time being. So I walked down pit lane, tried to see who's qualifying some of these GTD machines. And in the number 12 from Aim Vassar Sullivan Racing, it will be Frankie Monacavo. Uh, the number 14 will not qualify. We saw at the end of that practice session, they went back, thought maybe there was a, a sensor issue. They had an alarm going off. They've decided to go ahead and swap out that engine. So they're going to sit out this session. Um, then a little further down pit lane, um, the number 86 from Meyer Shank racing with Kerba G and the, uh, that will be Matt McMurray behind the wheel and in the number 57 from MSR with Heinricher racing it will be Trent Hinman behind the wheel another one that won't qualify is the number 54 from Black Swan Racing. Um, that's as far as I got down pit lane, but Shay Adam, I know you caught up with a couple teams also. I did, I saw Cooper McNeil, who was slated to drive the car, has elected not to. That will be Jeff Westfall with the yellow helmet taking out the number 63 Scuderia course Ferrari. In the 88 Audi, the only Audi in the field, that is Rolf Eichen taking control of that car. For the Porsche, the FAF Porsche, Zachary Robichon. Two poles last year, looking to improve upon that a little bit. The number 48 Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini was the first car in line to leave the pit lane, and that is being driven by Madison Snow. The number 11 GRT Lamborghini, it's Stein Schoenhorst, who actually had a huge crash in practice, getting a chance at a bit of redemption for the 11. In the sister car, and I say that full pun intended, the gear racing car, it's Christina Nielsen in the 19, the car that looks like a comic book strip. For the 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche, that is Ryan Hardwick. And up next, the two Aston Martins. It's Ian James in the heart of racing, and it is Lauda qualifying the number 98 Aston Martin. Matthias, thank you. Should that not be when you were mentioning the gear car? Should, should that not be the sister's car rather than the sister Ooh, car? Well played. Do you well like played. that? Okay, that's, that's, we've named that now. Uh, good afternoon to you wherever you are in the world. Cars are on the track. Hello to our colleagues up in Charlotte and thank you for the glorious images that we've got now in the booth and the first car through the bus stop that we see in a reasonable afternoon, overcast, but the liveries popping in the afternoon light uh, is the 48 Paul Miller Racing Lamborghini. On to the banking at turns three and four of the Speedway, the silver, black and red colours of Paul Miller Racing. Uh, still getting used to that, that team for a long time uh, running in a, a variety of blue colors uh, Jeremy Shaw and uh, we're gonna have to get used to some new liveries uh, throughout the field this true year. but this is pretty pretty similar is it not to the livery they ran when they won the championship a couple of years ago with Madison Snow and Brian Sellers together the dream team are reunited Madison 
uh, took a, a year out of racing to concentrate on the business. Uh, he was uh, categorised by IMSA as a, a gold driver, although still very much not earning his living as that, quite the reverse. He does pay for his racing and doesn't mind people uh, knowing that. He's a very quick driver, Johnny, and never got changed as far as the FIA rankings was concerned, but the IMSA driver committee, who are independent, uh, recategorised him, so he, he stepped away uh, under the... I remember speaking to him on Midweek Motorsport. He said, look, I, I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want to drive with anybody else. I want to drive with... with with Brian Sellers, who I've been paired with for, for quite a long time, and I, and I want to drive the Lamborghini for Paul Miller Racing. And if I if I can't do that, um, I'll you know I'll go back to, I'll go back to work. Yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. Cause I'm not trying to be a professional driver. Basically, is what he, was, yeah. what he was saying. I think wasn't he? Well, I know he's had the conversation several times with the, the, the IMSA officials, and uh, and still they maintain that uh, he is a gold. So he sort of has to suck that up really and uh, uh, deal with the current situation. Um, well, did, like, did, because they did. have relented. Sorry, yes, end. yes. Um, let's just deal with one or two hangovers from earlier on, because two cars um, didn't come in at the curfew point, which was 2 o'clock. The yeah. 11 car was released, which was the GRT Grasser Lamborghini, given a five-minute penalty into this session. The 23 Aston Martin, driven at the time by Nicky Team, was out on track as well, beyond the 2 o'clock. So both cars were pinged for a penalty. I had a word with Phil Pierce about it. Yes, we're going to have to sit out five minutes of this session. The only problem with that is the 23 Astons joined the session with Ian James at the wheel. The yes. 11 is sitting Correct. in pit road with Richard Hyde stand waiting to be part of the session. But I just wonder whether the 23... It's it's Dan Shawhorse be, uh, behind, behind the wheel of that car. And it behind has, which one? Uh, behind the wheel of the car that was serving the penalty, the one of the two. Which one is it? 23? 11. No, 11, no. Yes, well, 11. 23's out, gone, gone into the session, and yeah. I don't think it's allowed to, but we'll wait and see. 23 absolutely did not serve the penalty. The, the other car is serving the penalty, and which it's got 32 seconds still to go. Right. And is now, yes. I see what you mean. Stein Scott Horse, yes, indeed. He's at the wheel, and that number 11 Lamborghini now joins the session. Possibly a it's tad too early. early, I think. <laughs> uh, this he is might going have been well. Half a minute early. Uh, I, I do, I'll, I'll be honest yeah. with you. I don't know what the sanction is for not serving that penalty. I reckon they, they might they, they might lose all their times here. They might lose all their times. There's certainly there's a catch-all in the regulations that says you know at the discretion of race control. Yep. So uh, let's see what uh, happens as far as that is concerned. Uh, no time for messing about here, Johnny. We're, you know, down into the last two thirds of this session and still waiting for the first quick times to come in. Trent Hinman's gone to the top with a 147 and a half, and he was using a lot of the curb last time around in his Acura. The number 57 car, the second of the Acuras with Matt McMurray behind the wheel. The Auto Nation pink and black car following him through onto the infield at the moment and down towards the transition back to the speedway at turn number six. These NSX has had a good season last year. The MSR team had, had really got their heads around them, challenging for the championship the year before with Catherine Legg and missed out by a very narrow margin. So now already, Johnny, nine minutes to go. Into the bus stop again for the two NSXs. Man, they look fully committed through there. The front end just drifting in from the Trent Hinman car. So, at the moment, and has just gone to the top, the FAF Porsche, Zachary Robichon with Jeff Westphal in second. Jeremy Shaw has been doing a bit of digging uh, on what sanction might be applied uh, to the, uh, the cars that either didn't serve at all or didn't serve properly, their five-minute penalty. Because the penalty is actually going to be assessed for the practice, not the qualifying. They right. figured uh, that, that, was, uh, that would be too much of a draconian penalty. Right. So they're going to hold it for five minutes for the next practice session. So that's, uh, that answers that one. And thank you to Race Control for letting us know that. Indeed. Indeed to the race director, Bo Varpo, who's good enough to pass one that information. So Indeed, new sorry. top time, the plaid Porsche of Faf. Canadian team, you could guess that because of the lumberjack shirt. Do you have an affinity with that as well? You do like a bit of plaid shirt, don't I you? I do. Although yeah. you, uh, I have to say, very smart today in your uh, in your classic navy blue polo. Thanks very a nice. lot. Yes, yeah. it's, it's it's almost like team wear, but just hasn't got quite the right badges on it. But uh, yeah, I'm saving my better shirts, my RSL. Um, 
uniform for, for later on in the weekend when things get properly serious. These are just practice, well, the qualifying session now, but uh, easing my way into the week. So, uh, Zachary Robichon on a bit of a charge, already fastest, 145.237, and showing improvement on this lap too. And that is a new qualifying lap record. Wow. It eclipses the mark that was set last year by the Brazilian Marcos Gomez in the Ferrari, so excellent job by Zachary Robichon. Zachary has come up through the IMSA ranks, hasn't he, Jeremy? Yeah. We're racing in the the Porsche GT3 Cup Challenge USA. At, did he do Canada as yeah, well? Absolutely. I thought he did, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's done both of the series sanctioned by IMSA, the, a single manufacturer series for the Porsche uh, GT3 Cup cars, the cars that are uh, a global formula for Porsche-only racing, up to including the support races for Formula One in the Super Cup. And Zachary has been able to transfer his skills and knows how to look in the rear view mirror as well with his fast lap done. Really heads up driving by the young man. Yeah, because his next lap round was just fractionally slower at 145.256, which is also quicker than the standard from last year. So what a, what a, a great effort there by Robichon. Jeff Westfall in the white and black WeatherTech Ferrari is in second position. He's heading out on our left-hand side as we look out onto NASCAR one and two, and he's on the high banks of Daytona now. Let that Ferrari go. Not a thing in sight for him. He's got a cracking run down to the bus stop. Yeah, he has, yeah, but no toe, I suppose. I mean, it depends how best the uh, the Ferrari uh, deals with the speedway turns one and two. But uh, yeah, clear track is often a bit of a dream, particularly come to the, come the race, because it means you're leading generally. Robbie Foley up into fourth place then in the BOW for Turner Motorsports car number 96. Trent Hinman in third for Acura and Meyer Shank Racing. The uh, the BMW there, that's been pinged just a little bit since the raw test. A little bit of horsepower taken away, a slightly uh, smaller, a uh, little bit less boost on that on that engine to give it a, a 10 kilowatt uh, of, of energy less than before. So it slowed it down just a little bit, but Bobby Foley is still in the top five at the moment. Rolf in Eichen in fifth position in the Audi car number 88. Yeah, that's a good run for that car as well. Live from trackside, sound and vision linked together. IMSA Radio and IMSA TV. Daytona International Speedway. Rolex 24 at Daytona weekend. Under five minutes to go for GT Daytona qualifying. Oh, my goodness me. Rolf and Eichen really hanging it out. He's just dropped down to fifth position with other people improving around him. He's on the high banks at the eastern end of the track at the moment. So that's three and four coming onto the tri-oval now. Appearing from our left-hand side as we look down onto the start-finish line. He comes underneath us and crosses the line now and goes through. Does he improve? He does not. No, he Oh, no, he was close. Didn't quite. Wonder if he just he made a tiny little mistake and just dropped a couple of wheels off onto the dirt coming through the... back onto the speedway through the bus stop. That's one of the new Evo cars that uh, Rolf uh, is driving, the new updated Audis. The a slight difference on the front end of those cars is the big giveaway. One or two of the uh, GT3 category cars, the GT Daytona cars, have been uh, updated. There is a new uh, Mercedes-Benz AMG GT3 as well. We had a couple of those at Dubai uh, a couple of weeks ago. But uh, not here in IMSA competition. Ian Vassar-Sullivan. VS... Well, you can't miss the Lexus, the Bumblebee colour cars, if you will. 12 and 14. And we're not going to see 14. the 14 car. And that car with a seven-hour engine change, that is the car that Kyle Busch, current NASCAR Cup Series champion, is slated to drive, along with Michael de Cassade, Jack Hawksworth and Parker Chase. Looks like there's a bit of understeer there, a bit of push from the 
number 12, Lexis, as he mm. went into the international horseshoe there. Now, was he just a, a little bit quick going in there? It's Frankie Monte Calvo who's driving her. Is that car not quite pointing where he wants well, it to? Well, they, they've had to raise the, the note, I think, just a little bit on oh, this really? car. There's a new curb over at the chicane, I'm told, that uh, wreaked havoc with this, with this team in particular during the earlier practice sessions. They think running over that has caused the... Uh, Took the, oh. the bottom out of the sump on the on the on the on the sister car, and it ripped up the un the, the underfloor on the number 12 car as well. So uh, that might explain why they're not quite uh, all together with that car. Plus, Frankie himself, he's kind of recovering from a cold, so not feeling from he at his best either. You can't just Johnny change something on a car as fundamental as the ride height and, and expect everything else to be the same. You're going to change where the weight is on the car and how the car feels. Some drivers like the cars to be a little bit pushy, a bit understeery. They tend to think that that's a, a little bit more predictable. Uh, drivers, particularly in qualifying though, the top drivers like the car. You'll hear them say, well, I like it pointy. I like it on the nose. They don't mind the back end moving around. And that car, I would suggest, is the is the very antithesis of pointy at the moment. Well, yeah. I, I, the other thing is, when did this new curb appear? Since the raw, yes. presumably. So yes. they test on a particular track, mm. think the car is fine, and then a new bit of circuit infrastructure arrives and, uh, yeah, really puts the cat amongst the pigeons. One car is out for that team for the rest of the day, and the other one's had to be uh, worked on heavily. And as you say, you make one adjustment to i.e. the ride height and then that ripples through the rest of the car uh, as a result yeah and it looked to me like the car was kind of coming in there a little bit more balanced on the, on that lap than it did the previous one i think just getting some heat into those tires the Lexus, of course tends to overuse its rear tires so you maybe want a little bit of push in the car early on so you don't damage the rear tires uh, that but even with that uh, monte Carlo did improve on his last lap but not his position still in seventh and Stein's shot horse in the uh, number 11 car has now moved up to fifth with a 146.0. Hello to Phil Kinch back in Europe, choosing, tuning in Thursday evening. The sound of GT3 cars making my evening. I'm cheering on the Aston Martins from AMR official in the heart of racing. Good opportunity to mention the, the Astons. Paul Delalana not here. Bit of an injury skiing during the short break after uh, Christmas and into the new year. The car did run laps at the raw without him, uh, which means that he's qualified for the race. And indeed, Aston Martin, young driver, who you flew over with in, the, yeah. in, in your private jet, presumably. Yeah, precisely right, Palmer, yes. Uh, has, just has another 300 added. people on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you've got a lot of friends. That's right. <laughs> Party central. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, Andrew, who flew... Andrew uh, Watson, Andrew yeah. Watson, who was added to that squad which it makes it a very very impressive squad indeed Matthias Lauda, Pedro de la Lamy long time cohorts with uh, Paul de la Lana along with Ross Gunn factory driver and Aston Martin young driver than Andrew Watson third pole then for Zach Robichon and the uh, FAF team well he came on super strong last season won the uh, Sprint Cup, WeatherTech Sprint Cup last year. Really, really good first full season. So, Faf doing the job that they came to do. Part one, Lars Kern, along with uh, Dennis Olsen, Patrick Peele, uh, who was in with the championship shout last year with his uh, teammate Nick Tandy, finished second in the championship, would help with the manufacturers in GT Le Mans for Porsche. Lars Kern, if you don't know Lars, a uh, very accomplished racing driver and also quite good round the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Holds the production car record for Porsche uh, around there. And Lars tends to be the man who is given the duties of giving it uh, the new cars out there and off round the Nordschleife to do the most ridiculously quick times in Porsche's street cars so the plaid porsche plants itself on pole now just looking down the pit lane there did i see ian james get out of the aston martin the two vantages 12th and 13th uh, matthias louder and ian james i thought i saw ian james out the car you're not supposed to do that but um he's just jumped back in again maybe he was shouted at <laughs> that's that's fine 
So, I've got to say, the FAF team, uh, JP, looking like, yeah, okay, that's it, you know, we kind of expected that, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, half a second, mind quietly you. Quietly confident, and even more so, yeah, when they look at the times. Uh, they've got a strong lineup, and, you know, there's an argument as to how much actually single lap pace uh, contributes to a 24 hour race, but it'll be useful to uh, tick off some stints at that sort of speed with Zachary Z uh, Robichon at the wheel and uh, backed up with a great driving lineup outside of that as well, as you mentioned, uh, Lars Kern and uh, others. So. They'll be very, very happy with that. Uh, but uh, the beauty of the balance of the performance again this year throughout GTD doesn't give, really give anybody an advantage. Might give a certain car, you know, the, an advantage across, as I say, just one lap. But it, BOP's designed to be right across a stint. And yeah. that's tyre wear, that's, uh, you know, fuel usage and how the car evolves through a, what, r about a 55 minutes to an hour long stint for the GTD cars. Yeah, and, and it's not meant to completely iron out the diff different characteristics of cars either so there yeah. will be some tracks and some conditions where a manufacturer or a configuration of car a front engine a mid engine or a, a rear engine car is inherently better and and that it, that continues to be the case i don't think it, the, i think the guys at imza have done a cracking job uh, jeff carter and his team have done an absolutely cracking job in making the racing exciting without uh, completely anaesthetizing it uh, and you know and taking all the character away from it well Zachary Robichon is on his way down to claim the Paul award where Shea Adam is waiting now Shea uh, is uh, a US citizen but spends a bit of time in Canada and she's even got a Canadian flag on her race suit so this plaid Porsche pulling up for the pole position will certainly make her happy. It's a good one, that's for sure. And this is a team that, by the way, in the off season, had to change a sponsor, who is the same sponsor as the Pole Award. So what a way to thank the new sponsor then by going out and getting his third ever pole position award. And for Zachary Robichon, this is a totally different experience than Daytona a year ago. The team knows what they're doing. They changed after Belle Isle. Something seemed to click. And from then on, you guys have been contenders, race winners, pole winners. What's it mean to get a pole position at Daytona International Speedway, though? Yeah, I think it's it's pretty special, especially when we look back at you know where the where we were last year with our Porsche. We've made a lot of improvements, and obviously it's a 24-hour race. So if there's one race where qualifying maybe isn't that important, it's this one. But there's nothing takes away from you know being P1. So we'll take it, and uh, still lots of work to do. You've brought Patrick Pile into the team. You've added that secret weapon to the uh, the ingredients list. What's it been like working with a factory guy like Patrick? It's been really good. You know, we've, we've got a pretty fantastic crew with, with Dennis, Lars, and obviously Patrick coming in. He's won this race before, and he's done it a, quite a few times. So for Lars and myself and, and Dennis, we can take from him and, and learn, and sort of that relaxed French attitude, I guess, is wearing off on us. So was it the snazzy new fire suit that got you the pole positions that would made the difference? I think so. I just, you know, it's basically the same as what I wore to the track. So I think it just makes me feel more at home. Yeah, how do you even tell that you're in the fire suit, not just in street clothes then? It's actually a problem. A couple of times when they turn around in the pit box, they see your pants and they, they think we're wearing jeans. So yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> Congrats, Zach. Well done. Thank you. And for those of you watching in black and white, as the old saying goes, for those of you that uh, can't see, uh, Zachary Robichon, his race suit is effectively looks like a pair of blue jeans, but denim jeans, and a plaid lumberjack shirt, complete with buttons down the front as well. Yep. Uh, following up the colour scheme uh, on the car, and particularly the bottom part of the jeans, the, uh, the bottom part of the suit, the jeans part, looks very, very convincing indeed. I so assume I, uh, Dennis Olsen has a, a pair like that as well, because yeah, yeah. we could call him Dennis the Menace with that sort of colours. Oh, very colours. good. Uh, more of a jumper, wasn't it, for the, for the Beano character, but uh, it kind of fits with the red and black. The nice, there's some lovely touches on there. The national flags of the drivers are actually made into the belt belt buckle of the jeans. It looks like the belt buckle cool. part of the jeans. It's really, really cleverly done. Uh, attention to detail for those guys. And the Paul Award sticker going on to the left front of the FAF Porsche. And the number nine car gets, he gets a flag as well to go back to the hauler. And that will take pride of place, I'm sure, in the race shop back north of the border. So that's the first one of our pole positions settled.
Let me give you the cars behind Zachary Robichon. It was the WeatherTech Ferrari, the 63 car, uh, next up in second, some half a second further back. Tenth and a quarter further back from that in third, the first of the Acuras, the 57 uh, MSR car with Trent Hinman behind the wheel. Then BMW M6, number 96 from Turner. Robbie Forley, uh, some uh, another three tenths uh, further away. Raw three then, Steen Schothurst on the Lamborghini Huracan GT3, the number 11 car that was pushing hard early on. Then the 88 Rolf Nation car, that's uh, Rolf give it his best and at one stage he was up as far as fourth position but you have to start on the outside of the third row. That's your top six, all separated by less than a second. And in fact, Jeremy Shaw, uh, you can go down to eighth position before we're a second away from the leader and a nice spread of car manufacturers as well in there. Yeah, exactly right. Seven different manufacturers in the top seven positions. Porsche, Ferrari, Acura, BMW, Lamborghini, Audi, and then Lexus. The first of the repeaters is Lamborghini in eighth spot. That's Madison Snow, the champion from two years ago. Well, that's how we do qualifying in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. That's the first 15-minute session. Let's head back down to the pit lane where Jamie Howe can tell us who will be coming out next. Well, next will be GT Le Mans, John. And I'm going to give these qualifiers to you in numerical order because that's the way I have them written down. So in the number three. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not having that at all. Let's it mix just makes too much sense, no, right? I, I, I've given Shea all kinds of weird and, and wonderful ways that she's... Is shoe, shoe, shoe size where they were in the championship? Well, that, that doesn't matter at this time of the year. All right, I'll give you okay. at, the, at the first race of the season, I'll let you have numerical order, okay, Jamie. Thank you. I'll be I'll be better prepared for season. Bring, okay. <laughs> All right. So in the number three from Corvette Racing, it will be Antonio Garcia, the first qualifying effort with that new C8R. Um, the number four machine will be Tommy Milner. Number 24 from BMW Team RLL in the M8, it will be John Edwards. And the number 25 M8, also from BMW Team RLL, will be Philip Ng. And then the number 62, the lone Ferrari from Risi Competizione, will be Alessand uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And the 911, the Porsche 911 RSR, will be Nick Tandy. And then in the 912 will be Lawrence Fanthor. Right, thank you. Seven cars, a small but perfectly formed field. Uh, we've had a couple of practice sessions where mostly they've been paired up to Porsches, to Corvette, to BMWs and the Ferrari. It was a little more mixed up in the last session. Where's your money going? Full dry circuit, not too warm, starting to rubber in. Uh, are we going? Uh, we're at Daytona. Uh, Tandy's pretty good round here. Looks like the Corvettes are going early as the green no flag. No too shabby around here, are they? No, they've, yeah. they've. I think they'd like to put a stamp on this, if I'm honest. The C8 are radically different in looks, sound, and indeed engineering concept with the V8 engine moved to the middle of the car, now sitting behind the driver. Uh, listen, love it or love it, you've got to agree that at least that it's very purposeful indeed, even the attention to detail of the pitot tubes out of the front of the car, which me measure air pressure when they're going through, so that gives you uh, particular uh, particular measurements that the, that the uh, engineers use. That's even got a little fairing on it as well, just above the the Corvette badge, they, they look purposeful. Yeah. And certainly the dark grey car, the number four machine, the three is uh, Corvette racing yellow. My goodness, they are, it's very slippery out there. Huge understeer through the uh, international horseshoe for the three. The four's gone out behind. The dark grey car does look like it's been weaponized. It could be hung on a hard point of some kind of fighter or maybe dropped from a Black Hawk, which is just going across the the race track at the moment the dark gray color car has a bit of f16 and stealth technology in that car it'll take a few minutes to get up to pace then all right jeremy seven out there uh, we often don't see the full potential of the gt le mans cars until right at the ends of qualifying we expect to see them out for the whole 15 minutes the michelin tires will go that long they'll be burning fuel off corvette porsche bmw or the lone ferrari hmm. good question he's given me a look <laughs> like thunder here yeah. there I thanks hang off the, the, uh, the, the ferrari's been slowed down just a little bit uh, 
since the test here a couple of weeks ago. It was fastest then, I think. Yes. Um, so, gosh, I don't know. Um, should slow it down by quite a bit on the straights. I'd, I'd say it's going to be uh, either. <laughs> it's either going to be Porsche, either. Corvette, <laughs> Ferrari, or BMW. Uh, I think so. I yes. think so. I'm going to go with the Ferrari again. Oh, are you? Are you? JP, you've watched all the uh, practice so yeah. far, I'm and you've been delving into the practice times from the raw. I'm going to go with the Porsche one too, plain and simple. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah Ooh, I'm afraid. Could be right. I think uh, they've, mm. they've got too much, and you know, th there's a lot of, you know, keeping powder dry through the first few sessions of the weekend, but uh, the gap's too great for me. They've, uh, al they've also been uh, added a little bit of weight since the uh, since the raw test as well, uh, 10 kilos or 22 pounds or so. Um, but I, I fancy. Corvettes have been given a little tiny little bit more power, a bit of weight taken out they of them. So I think the Corvettes will be strong. This really should be quite good fun. I don't, I don't think it's clear cut, let's put it that no, way. No, absolutely. Uh, Johnny, you've had the advantage of seeing the Porsches in competitive action as the voice of the FIA World Endurance Championship for our Radio Show Limited broadcasts. Uh, for that season, which of course started back in September, and you're halfway through that season. Uh, although these drivers haven't had the competition, the car certainly has, and the data that their sister team running in the World Championship has had is, is eminently transferable. Yeah, yeah, and of course, uh, this being the American arm of uh, Porsche Motorsport, so they look after these two cars, and it's the German side, for, formerly Team Manti, possibly still Team Manti. There's yeah, a which bit is of now wholly owned by Porsche. Yeah, OK, yeah. they look after the... Uh, and say the European cars, but the World Championship cars. Uh, but they talk to each other, and you know they know what the strong points are of that uh, the, those two new Porsches that, that uh, run in the World Championship. They've already won two races, the shorter ones at Silverstone and Shanghai. So it's been incredibly good in the early days of this new car. Well, they don't sound like the old cars, but I'm, I'm not, not disappointed. That's a really interesting sound from the now 4.2. Flat six. And by the way, a Corvette just went past us. No, time. I didn't, Jamie. You did, no, I, I, could, I would have felt yeah. the ground shake yeah, yeah. and my sternum rattle. I know. No way. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I'm not th sure I like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just stick that in for, for some of the, uh, you know, classic vet fans. Oh, my goodness. How close to the inside tyre bill there at turns one, at the apex of turn one for Porsche number nine. 11 and very close indeed uh, green spots on the top of the headlights those little four running lights green spots for the 911 and yellow for the 912 uh, you'll know that if you have downloaded andy blackmore's sporters guide that he does for imza and on behalf of imza also pick one up here at the track if you're on site www.spotterguides.com andy blackmore's guides uh, with done with complete buy-in from the teams, uh, the original and best. Well done, Andy. Another cracking set of guides for this championship and for the Michelin Pilot Ch Challenge as well. So Nick Tandy out there in 911. Now, one thing that I noticed about the Porsches when they were going out, and this is never, ever a good thing, and it takes me back to the first iteration of the 991 shaped cars is they are porpoising. They are porpoising down the back straight before they break into the bus stop and Shea's just said exactly the same as they're coming through the tri-oval. Now anybody who's owned a 911 will tell you if the front end is pottering around and bouncing up and down, that's not a good feeling. And no less light than uh, Dario Franchitti once told me that uh, if you're pushing on in a Porsche, make sure you fill the fuel tank up. You never want to be on really light fuel because it's in the front and it's crucial to the balance of the car. And that's a street car. And I've not seen a Porsche bounce like that for a very long time, Jeremy. Remember that when they, they had the 991, the first iteration, I think it was, of the 991 after they come from the 997 shape. And that car, when it was fast, it was very fast. When it wasn't, it was awful. They had a very narrow setup window for that car. 
So we'll have to see what the times are like. Well, not bad. Nick Tandy's just gone to the top with a 44-3, but that won't be good enough, Jeremy Shaw, for pole position. It won't, not by a long, a long talk. Uh, Nick Tandy does indeed hold the qualifying lap record here. That was a 142.257. I wonder if they are on low fuel there. Nick Holland has just noticed it as well. He's tweeted in at IMSA Radio using the hashtag IMSA Radio. In the background, folks, this is a Corvette. Oh, good, we've now cut away from that. I'm sorry. But, uh, yeah, if you heard that underneath us, no, that's, I didn't. that's the Corvette now <laughs> these days. Get used to it. Well, but don't forget the engine's behind the onboard camera now rather than in front, which is no, going to change. There was no throaty yeah, grumble it's, there. It's a big difference past, past our booth, isn't it? Yeah. Still normally triangle. aspirated, that engine, it is, though. Yeah, yeah, but it, does, it almost sounds like it's turbocharged. Yeah, it a does. lot of people said that when they saw the footage of the car. Here it comes. Did it, here it, here it, here it, it should be here soon, shouldn't it? Has it gone through? A lot of people, Johnny, interestingly, when the first... Um, it did go through, went fastest. Well, <laughs> 143. Well, a lot of people said when the first footage was leaked by uh, Corvette Racing, from a Sebring test. Oh, that's a turbocharged car. But remember back to the early 2000s and Dr. Ulrich, uh, Ulrich Beretsky, who was the head of Audi's engine program, um, the engine guru, he always said, I'm, I'm not into cars making a lot of loud yeah, noise. Yeah. Waste of energy. It's a waste of energy. That's exactly what he said. Noise is energy and I don't want to waste energy. I want that going through the crankshaft, down the prop shaft and into the back wheels through the diff. Interesting. Discuss. <laughs> I think the noisy cars sell better. <laughs> <laughs> Says just, the boy from Birmingham. It just, it <laughs> just goes better into a street car. You impress your mates far more, surely, when you start revving it. You can just use a six-inch nail and knock it through the muffler, put a few, you know... That's true, yeah. Put yeah, a few yeah. holes in it. All right. <laughs> we'll find an answer. Six minutes to go. Porsche through and down into turn one. That's the 912. Lawrence Vanter did all the qualifying last year for that Porsche 912 championship winning team. In the meantime, his teammate Nick Tandy's back to the top with a 42.7. That's a bit better. Yeah. Half a second quicker than the field and yeah. going quicker again in the 9-1-1 on this lap around. At least through the first sector, yeah. Purple in the first sector, but not in the second. He lost a little bit of time uh, down before he got to the bus stop. So he's going to come through now, uh, turns three and four onto the, on the, on the banking, come toward the tri-oval. Is there an improvement there for Antonio Garcia? Yes, there is. 42.705 takes the number three car to the top. Ferrari across the line remains in seventh position. Yelch. Tommy Milner is second off. 42626, <laughs> the new fastest time. This is fun. Five minutes still remaining. And the BMW number 25 in third position for Philip Enzo. We've got Porsche, Chevrolet, Corvette, BMW M6 in the top three. Separated by seven tenths of a second. It's a relatively long lap here, but we've seen it closer in the past. How about the second Corvette, though? Johnny Palmer, a second off the second BMW, a second and a half off, and the Ferrari, well over a second and a half, nearly a second and three quarters off. 1.6, 9-1 to be exact. Yeah, Alessandro Pierguidi pushing as hard as he can, but it just looks like that Ferrari 488 doesn't have any answers right now. The seventh of the GTLM cars, and very much seventh. And again, I, did, I mean, I did pick that for the, for the pole, but... Uh... Uh, they won't be worried too much. I'm sure they won't be worried about that. They're not Vantor worried about qualifying. To the top, 142.256. So that leapfrogs uh, Nick Tandy. And That's your Porsche beat, one two, beats his lap go. record by a thousandth of a second. A new lap record, in or at least a new qualifying record, qualifying should I say, record. in the 912. Nine, nine, Oh, I do like the low down noise that that Porsche makes. That's quite purposeful, that, without being too shouty. OK, yeah. yeah. Mm. If, if, if indeed you ever want the 911 RSR 19 with the huge rear wing uh, and the full decal pack uh, on it to be not too shouty. I'm a bit more of a GT3 touring man rather than the full-on GT3 with all the, all the wings. But I, I've got to say, I like say that. No, no, no. <laughs> and there's another fastest time. Nick Tandy not taking that line down. 42.207. The hits keep on coming here, Jeremy. Yeah, they do, don't they? Those two Porsches then separated by just 0 0.049. But it's 0.49 behind both of those two cars. This is the best of the Corvettes. 
Nick Tandy just drifting the car in, backing it in almost like a motorcycle into turn one. That may have lost him a bit of time. It may be that that's how he's rotating the car into turn one because he takes an insane amount of speed down from the banking. He's braking so late as to almost discount the first part of turn one and just make it as straight as he can and then drifts the car to get it through the second part of the corner and out onto the middle straight. Amazing stuff, amazing car control from the man who started his career, Johnny Palmer, in short oval racing and looks at this place. And in fact, when he demoed last year's car at Talladega after uh, Petit Le Mans, fulfilled a lifelong dream. This is a man who would love to be driving in the 500 here at Daytona. Yeah, it's amazing that he drives cars with this high spec technology. And actually his dream is, is, is NASCAR, which is um, not quite up to, to, to standard, I suppose, with all the wings and, th and you know, the electronics uh, that these uh, modern day GTLM, oh. GTE cars carry. Started his career, I think, at 14 in mini stocks. Yeah. If, uh, if memory serves. to watch him. Did yeah. you? Hmm. Good for you. What do you think of symmetry right now on the timing charts, John? 9-11, uh, 9-12, good. Three from four, yes. No, hang on, BMW have got this wrong. 25's ahead of 24. Can yeah. we can we have that swapped over? We're going to have them two by two. You've got to have them in numerical order. Ideally, of course, we should have the whole field in number order, but, you know, that would please Corvette. Not so much the 9-11 and 9-12. They'd have to be all the way down. But I'm happy two by two by two. Who I tell you, who will not be that happy is that any Ferrari fans. As Jeremy says, it doesn't no. matter that uh, Alessandro Pagidi uh, is going to start seventh of seven when you've got 24 hours and potentially 800 laps of the track here to do. But I think they would like to be a bit closer than 1.4 seconds. They've they've trimmed a couple of tenths off there inside the last minute. The Porsches have lifted out of it. Yeah, you, but you know Rick Mayer is not going to concentrate it's on clever qualifying lad. around here. The clever lad, there at, uh, yeah, they they are. so. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, looking, they're looking more for consistency. Uh, last lap around, Piagidi did improve in each of his three sectors. That, that, that was the, not the best time that he could have managed. Tommy Milner's on a slightly better lap this time around. He's in fourth position at the moment in car number four. 33.535 through the first sector and quicker again through the second sector as well. Do you know, I love the calibre of endurance racing fans. Rob Chalmers, who rather knows what he's talking about, he says, I'm watching that uh, Porsche 911, both of the cars porpoising from front diffuser stall out, I reckon. The infield undulations aren't nearly as bad as what's happening on the, uh, the banking, so it might be just a little bit of a, an aero issue with that car stalling out. So that could be fixed maybe by a bit of rake adjustment, maybe by a bit of ride height. Is it a chosen setup for qualifying? Well, Are they it, gonna calm it down again for the race? Well, Vantour does that, absolutely. Check it flag out. Tommy Milner did improve on that lap to get within a tenth of a second of Antonio Garcia, his teammate is right behind him out on the racetrack also. An yeah, he's getting a tour, for John Edwards. Uh, he's getting John. a tour. Those two have got one more lap to do, yep, and the have. Corvettes are giving each other a tour here. This could be a concerted Corvette effort to steal away pole position from Porsche. Checkered flag is out. You're allowed to finish the, the lap you're on. The 911 will go no quicker than a 142.2, which is quick enough at the moment, but 142.256 is the teammate car, and that is on Speedway three and four at the moment coming on to the tri oval for lawrence van Tua. stays in the middle of the road traces the shortest distance to the flag it's not a bad lap it's not been he was quick in the first sector he does it broad he doesn't not quite fastest of anybody in the last sector but doesn't improve my goodness that was a just a slight mistake maybe in the Middle sector. No, I think it was just a great, well, and a, and a great first sector for Nick Tandy because mm. uh, he had a couple of tents on him in the first sector. Did Tandy now over what, Vantor? What about the vets? A very good centre section for Tonio Garcia. Will they come through and steal away? Can they manage somehow to split these Porsches, even if pole position's not there? Can they get a Corvette C8R on the front row across the line? Milner improves, but not quite enough. No, it's, it's Garcia that improves, but not quite enough. Still three tenths away. Found a couple of tenths there, Jeremy, but yep. Porsche 1-2. That means we're 
by enjoying a drink <laughs> that, tonight. That was Sorry yeah, if I true. extracted any excitement out of that, that session, that, that by was the way. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I, I didn't know for a fact, but uh, but the, the signs were there earlier on in the uh, yeah, in, oh, in no a few question days. they were. Yeah, uh, but the the, the the number three car there towing the number four car picked up a couple of tenths of a second on that final lap. Yeah, very good, very good indeed. Uh, Wicker Bill says, uh, are they the same spec Porsche in the WEC? Now, if so, they sounded amazing at Silverstone. Yes, they are. Uh, this is the first time we've seen them in anger here in the US, as we were mentioning earlier on. Johnny, our voice of the WEC, live free broadcast on the RSL network of audio and visual channels, is uh, has seen half of that season. Uh, they're the same type of car, but they're not the same cars, of no, course. They're indeed. different chassis. Different chassis, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I do like this new colourway. They've gone back to the Porsche shield shape. If you look straight down on the car, the front um, apes, the whole car colour apes the Porsche shield that's on the front of every, which, uh, every Porsche, which uh, has elements of the uh, Stuttgart town coat of arms on it as well. But having gone from just red, white and black, there's a bit of grey on there and a nice red stripe. Uh, down the middle just needs one over the top doesn't it to make it the cross of St. George really yeah. on there for the for us English fans Nick Tandy then claims another pole position they started well last year plain carbon helmet for Nick after all of the special liveries that he had last year simply has Nick written on his overall belt he'll take off his helmet and then we'll have a chat with him let's go down to Jamie he actually just asked John, do you like my new helmet design? That solid black carbon you were just talking about, a class record ninth pole position for you in WeatherTech competition, Nick. But it was a little bit of back and forth. What edge were you on? Um, yeah, it was the limit. <laughs> we didn't time it quite right this, this, uh, this year, but I did manage to get close enough to the, um, the Ferrari in front. I think towards the end of the session, we picked up a little draft, which kind of helped us, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously a great start to the, to the year, our defense of the championship. Um, I've got some new teammates with me, so it's great to, to share it with those guys. And uh, yeah, a new car, and it all starts off well with a 1-2, so we can't be, can't be happier. The guys upstairs were commenting on the attitude of the car as you came around the tri-oval specifically. What differences do you feel behind the wheel of the new machine? Um, I mean, everything's slightly different, but it's still a racing car. It's still a Porsche. It's still got its Porsche DNA. Um, you know, you press the pedals, you turn the steering wheel, and you feel what the tires are doing underneath you. But uh, all the magic is done back at the factory and uh, back in the, the, the garage. And it's all the stuff you don't see. You know, you see the car on track, but it's the stuff that's going on underneath that all the hard work goes into. And, um, yeah, it's nice to be able to justify everybody's effort and... Um, yeah, just congratulations to Porsche and, and Porsche North America for, for starting off like this. It's great. Oh, like my family at home. When you have a session that it's just your class out on the track, you're able to, to kind of come to grips with it a little bit. What did you learn in qualifying? Not a lot, to be honest. Um, the only thing really is if we're the end, of uh, the end of the race finishes with a short yellow and you're on fresh tires with low fuel, but past that, the qualifying session is pretty irrelevant. Um, the, the, the race is one with you know, either used tyres or on full tanks. So the, it's always nice to drive a car in qualifying like this. But uh, yeah, the race, races can be very, very different, especially these 24 hour ones. That's Nick Tandy on pole for the 24 hours of Daytona in the GT Le Mans category behind the wheel of the 911 Porsche 911 RSR. John. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, new race suits as well for the Porsche guys again with the red stripe uh, down the middle. A uh, big smile from Nick Tandy, mainly because he's been speaking to Jamie, obviously. The, the pole position is a, you know, as an aside there, I, th I think. No, I'm great, great job by Tandy. What a battle between him and Lawrence Van Tour. Uh, Tony Garcia joining the party. Tommy Milner at the end as well. Uh, the Corvettes, what, sort of three-tenths away, Jeremy, from that. And, yeah, I think they'll take heart from that in a new car. And the, the best lap on the last lap from Tony Garcia as well on the, on the third-place machine. Yeah, I think it's a very strong effort from Corvette there, and particularly through the middle sector. Uh, both of the cars in particular, Antonio Garcia, I think might be fastest of all through that middle sector. She's not showing up as purple on our scoring monitor, but mm. uh, may maybe Lawrence Van Tours just isn't sh kind of showing up yet because he hasn't crossed the start-finish line. But still, uh, he was quicker, Antonio Garcia was, through the middle sector than Nick Tandy. So that bodes very well, I think, for Corvette. 
Let's go down to Shea Adam, who has our qualifying drivers for the uh, prototype category, starting with DPI and Accurate, if you would, please. Uh, which one would you like? The seven. Numbers, the number seven is Ricky Taylor, uh, the sister car, the championship winning car from last year. Juan Pablo Montoya is driving in the number six. If we go... 55 Mazda. 55 Mazda, Jonathan that's Lomarito. The, that's the red car. That's the red one, the 77, white 77, the blue... Uh, the, uh, Black, red, and white car. The one that broke the unofficial fastest lap time from last year. Well, who was on pole last year? That would be Ollie Jarvis. Who is qualifying the 77 this year? That would be Ollie Jarvis. 81. 81 is Henrik Hedman okay. for Fun. Dragon Speed. Yeah, looking great in its evil Knievel uh, look-alike uh, color schemes with those uh, stars and stripes. I'm still getting used to seeing the uh, Masters in two different uh, liveries. Sorry, who did you say was in the 55, Shea? Sorry. Uh, the 55 is Jonathan Bomarito. Thank you. Saw the blue helmet there. Excellent. Right, who else have you got? 52, the Pier 1 Matheson Motorsports LMP2 car that was fastest during the roar. That is Ben Keating once again driving that car for the qualifying session. In the Tower Motorsport car, that's one that's assisted by Starworks. It's John Ferrano, so going out the there to eight. represent Canada. Number eight for that car. The number 31 is the Whalen Engineering Cadillac. That is being driven by Philippe Nasser, so that'll be a very fast car. Number 18, which is another one of those LMP2 cars, the Era Motorsport car, Dwight Merriman taking the qualifying duties for them. In the 38, the last LMP2 car, that's Canadian Cameron Castles getting the honor here at Daytona. And for the last three cars, well, they're all Cadillacs. JDC Miller Motorsport has Tristan Vaudier behind the wheel of the 85. It's Wow Barbosa for Mustang Sampling, trying to represent their honor. And for the 10, the defending race-winning team, that's Ryan Briscoe, new boy, getting a chance to go out and qualify. Very interesting, and he's first in line with that number 38 sentinel spine car in behind the, the key thing there is the five mustang sampling we were seeing that last year at uh, jeremy shaw uh, and it is still the five mustang sampling car it's still got joao barbosa behind it but they have changed teams this year mustang sampling is the presenting sponsor of the car and they've moved teams for the the running of that car over the winter months Yes, indeed, to G JDC Miller Motorsports. And just just going back briefly, though, to the uh, the, the qualifying drivers here. In LMP2, it has to be the uh, bronze-rated driver that qualifies the car. And uh, the only team that has more than one bronze-rated drivers in, in there is the Performance Tech Motorsports car, car number 38 with Cameron Castle's Robert Masson, Kyle's father, and Don Yount. Uh, and uh, as we heard uh, Shea say, it's going to be Cameron Castles who qualifies that car. The other, the other, uh, every other car in the class, that's kind of mandated by the, by the regulations because they only have one bronze driver in each of them. The Soul Red Crystal Mazda number 77 looks absolutely a picture down there on the pit road at the moment. It's been polished within an inch of its life. Green flag is in the air now. The countdown begins and leading them out then that number 10 with Ryan Briscoe very complimentary about the Cadillac from Conington and Alta racing run by Wayne Taylor racing of course and uh, he returning to prototype duties leads out the field for this 15 minute dash for overall pole position the lmp 2s not really in contention now for the overall as they had been in previous years, a couple of seasons ago that went right down to the wire. But since then, the regulations here have changed and the LMP2s put into a class by themselves and slowed down considerably. In fact, actually, the DPI speeded up as well to make a little bit of a performance differential. Oh, dear me, there's re everybody really struggling coming out of the pits. Remember, no tyre warmers allowed in IMSA competition. And what I'm seeing Johnny in the first certainly lap or so, particularly at the international hairpin, is in the middle of the night coming out of the pits. You might not want, we were talking about tyre allocation earlier on, 38 sets for the TPI. You might not want a new set on. No, no, I'll just keep me warm but nicely warmed. Set of Michelin's on. Yeah, certainly not brand new tyres because, of course, you've got that releasing yeah. agent on the top of it as well to take it out of the mould. That's what makes so, them look silver. It's got yeah, a silver so you've got to oxide, scrape yeah. all that off and scrub, scrub it clean. And uh, that won't have been done by the point that you get to the Western uh, Horseshoe. So that's the reason why uh, Dixon was really struggling to turn the car in there on the right hander. The, also, the reason I think that the Acura team Penske this morning 
uh, went what three quarters of the way through the session before they actually turned any serious lap times. They're just mm. going in and out of the pits and scrubbing a new set of tyres. Scrubbing tyres, doing driver change practices. I mean, you know, interesting. Very interesting. Big picture. But I know this is a 24-hour race, guys, and it'll take a couple of laps, I think, for these guys to get up to speed here. I know this is a 24-hour race, but there is a cash here. There is, there are bragging rights, and certainly for your manufacturer and your team and your sponsors, there is value to being pole position for the Rolex 24 hours of Daytona, isn't there? Yeah, big time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a question. I, know, I don't even know whether that actually enters anybody's mind now. It's just automatic. Uh, so Ryan Briscoe then heading down towards the same point where he really struggled for grip. Uh, Look better this time. Yeah, yeah, much better, just because that's the beauty of uh, what an outlap gives you. I just wonder whether maybe even the second flying lap, though, uh, is will be even better because those tyres from a completely cool te temperature are still building up to uh, full race pace. Cadillac engine on the banking, going to full revs. Now down into the braking area for the bus stop. These prototypes break very, very late indeed. Not right up towards the wall, comes from three quarters of the way across the track, hammering the curbs on the first part of the bus stop. Left, then the first right, then the second right, and then you straight line the exit curb. There's actually not really a left turn. You just straighten the wheel up as much as you can and point it towards the banking. Let the banking straighten you out. Just lets the car breathe off NASCAR turn four, going past one of the JDC cars on the a... The other JDC no, car. Yes, the other JDC <laughs> car, thank you. I'm going to do that for a while yeah, as well. Yeah, both are. That was the Mustang sampling car going into the bus stop as well. Black with the gold colouring, traditional now. Mustang sampling colours. A little bit of gold on the tail fin as well of that car. Great to see Mustang Sampling still involved. Ryan Briscoe in the 10 was fastest first, but not for long. What an opening lap by Joao Barbosa in that number five car. 138-0, a second and a half quicker. So he's he's going about his qualifying in a very different way from Ryan Briscoe. He's attacked much more, Jeremy Shaw, in the second two-thirds of that second flying lap. Yep. Uh, you know, a massive amount of experience around here, of course, Joao, so we have no, confident, no lacking in confidence there. This is his 18th Rolex 24 at Daytona, so uh, lots of time in these cars as well. So, you know, he's, he's pretty comfortable. But uh, on the, the next sector, there was a purple there for Ryan Briscoe, but that's, uh, that's gone away, so it must be... Yeah, it's uh, Tristan Voce has gone purple, actually, in the first sector. He hasn't even yet turned... A uh, full a, lap. A lap time, no. Yeah. So. Juan Ma Montoya, fastest in the last sector, in the number six from Acura Team Penske, with the uh, the blue highlighting on the front of that car, and he's already into his next lap, and that has translated into a quick first sector. So that's one to watch. Everybody trying to get their laps in early. It's Ryan Briscoe, Cadillac number ten from Cadillac number five, and Joao Barbosa. Felipe Nasser in the 31 Cadillac in third, but there's three seconds between those top three. Yeah, it was certainly a good lap there by Ryan Briscoe. He's completed one more lap in the second and third place cars at the moment. 35.0 for Briscoe. Barbosa now completes that third lap, 35.3, but Tristan Vautier jumps them all. 34.930, third time around for the number 85, Tristan Vautier. Expanded LMP2 field this year with the change of how the Rolex Daytona uh, 24 hour Daytona has uh, fitted in the championship and Ben Keating is the best LMP2 car wow. in the number 52 last time yeah. around the PR1 Matheson Motorsport to fifth position overall yeah very good 137.4 there for uh, for Ben Keating the lap record was set in LMP2 <laughs> last year by James Allen at a 135.9 but the guy to watch here is Oliver Jarvis he's He's uh, in the... Where is He's he? a master of this place, Yeah, Molly Jarvis. Two, two new names at the top of the time, so Juan Pablo Montoya's just done a 134.1. Jonathan Bomarito in the 55 Mazda goes second, and his time a 134.2.
The 31, Whelan, red and white car, really hanging it out and getting airborne going into the bus stop last time around for Philippe Nasser. His reward is fourth position, but seven tenths off and Jarvis goes through underneath us and goes to pole position by half a second. And it's another half a second back from Montoya to Oli Jarvis's teammate in the 55 car. And only 27 thousandths away from his uh, pole position record set last year, Oliver wow. Jarvis. 133.712 wow. he's done already. But uh, Ryan Briscoe on this lap, he was about, I think he was three tenths quicker. The time's gone away now for, for Jarvis, but uh, purple for Ryan Briscoe, three tenths quicker. 134.4 he turned on the lap, but as blistering final sector. Jarvis absolutely extraordinary through the dog leg in the 77, the white Mazda. Such commitment from the Englishman in the 77 car. This is going to be a lap record this lap, no question. If you get, he's had a clear lap, state. Jeremy, yeah, and yeah. if he keeps this clean, he's into the bus stop now. Let's see how much Kirby takes. Oh, no, that's lovely, lovely and smooth. Doesn't even use all the road in the bus stop. That Mazda is turning exactly as Ollie Jarvis wants. It's the run to home now. And a very low line through the banking. They're yes. just taking the shortest possible Absolutely. route around here without scrubbing off speed. Right down on the yellow line through NASCAR Goose three and four. A little bit wider than I'd have expected off turn four, but tight into the trioval across the line he goes. Now, oh, he 6.39 it's to run. It's quicker. It's quicker, but not quick enough to beat his record. Lost a, lost a fair bit of time in the middle sector there somewhere. Maybe it was going on to the banking. No, I didn't see it. But, has uh, he lifted? I think he has. We'll soon get his first sector tie. Doesn't look to be as committed. He's got time to cool the Michelin tyres, maybe, and have one more go at it behind him. Montoya, 134-1. He's just done a very slow lap, so he's cooling his Michelins. Now, will he stay out and have another one? 34-2 from Jonathan Bomarito. So that was a little improvement. So half a second between the top three, then two tenths further back, Philippe Nasser with that uh, spectacular, but not particularly tidy lap in the 31 Cadillac. I, by the way, I'm not saying I could do any better because I couldn't, but I think there's time there for Philippe in the 31 Whelan car. Yeah, and six of the seven cars then within a second, the only one who's not is Joao Barbosa. He was the guy who went to hell for leather right on, out of the blocks, was fastest on the first lap, but did he go too fast too soon on this set of Michelin tyres? Ricky Taylor's taking a while to get up to speed, but he is now up to sixth position with a 134.580. That's in the number seven Accurate Team Penske DPI. So uh, that car, the sister machine to the one that's currently second and being driven by Juan Pablo Montoya. So uh, second and sixth for the Penske cars. <laughs> Purple uh, there for Montoya in second place, 134.154 on that last lap, having uh, cooled down those tires for one lap, but. John Hunter, we did go quicker that time around. Uh, Rob Chalmers has just said, I'm not sure who was in the 31. It was Philippe Nasa, Rob, you are clearly watching uh, the pictures on the international stream. He said, I don't know whether they're clenched coming into the bus stop, but I certainly did, and I'm four and a half thousand miles away. <laughs> that was quite a squirm and quite a leap over the kerb, wasn't it? Uh, we've seen one or two cars do that. That's where you, you uh, gain a load of time into the bus stop, as violent as it looks. Uh, yeah, I, I love the fact that everyone round them. Oh, uh, we've got some debris uh, on the circuit in the bus stop and the yellow and red flag out. Yellow and red flag, often people talk about that as slippery surface. It just actually means something's on the track that's not there. Um, it can be rhymed with something on the track, uh, but I'd rather not in the broadcast. I'd like to keep my job. The, so that is going to cause a little bit of a problem. You don't have to slow down as you would with a uh, stationary yellow. It's just there to warn you that there's something on the track. So you're still allowed to improve your time oh, yeah. there. I, I love the idea that there is a community here at the track. And by the way, the infield is packed with spectators. I have never seen a Thursday crowd like this before. There's extra camping being opened up. It was bonkers getting in this morning because of everybody turning up early to the event. This is going to be a big crowd here this weekend. And great to know that you're all tuning in in Sound and Vision on uh, IMSA TV or on radio-show.co.uk and, of course, listening on RS2 IMSA Radio. We'll have the whole race for you live on XM Sirius.
Uh, Sirius XM, excuse me, if you're here in the States on Sunday. 107.9 around the track as well. If you're listening on the PA here and you want to go back to your RV or your car, you can tune in as well. And of course, this kind of frequency, if you are so quick equipped, as always, this kind of frequency. 454, oh, it's a big off for the Acura number yeah. seven. Big off for Ricky Taylor, seemed to have lost the car very early. He's gone in nose first, destroyed the front. This, I think, will be a red flag. 2.45 to go. And that was going through the bus stop and lost it completely in the first part of the bus stop. Car did not turn at all. Probably took a bit too much curb, but I'll reserve that. The good news is Ricky's fine. The thumbs up to the marshal, it popped the door open. I don't think he did that himself. Now that, he was very committed coming into the bus stop. Got, got over airborne, that inside curb. got airborne. Yeah, that's that new curb on the inside. We've, uh, we talked about that during the GTD session. Uh, uh, the drive, several drivers have told me that's new since the roar. And uh, it looks like the car just turned it a little bit better than Ricky Taylor had expected. It got well airborne and he lost it when he, when he came back to the ground. Yeah, it wasn't quite straight, didn't, didn't nail the landing. I would have no. lost, lost a tenth in gymnastics for that. All the car bunny hopping up and the car pitching first to the right, then the left. He so nearly caught it. The reflexes of uh, a cat on energy drink almost got it back. But a heavy frontal impact and the door popping open. He hit the tyre wall on driver's left in the middle towards the end of the bus stop. And he was about a couple of feet from missing that tyre wall and uh, hitting concrete, but the tire wall does its job. It dissipates the impact, and Ricky's out. Uh, he's having a look at the front of the car. Well, I tell you what, I don't think there's anything he could have done about that. Nothing at all. If that's the line through the corner, nothing he could have done. Clock continues to run. No, he took a bit too much curb. I mean, yeah. And then, and then it's just the pendulum effect, isn't it? Because the yeah. engine's in the, you know, in the back of the car and it starts swinging around. And like you say, you can try and react. I think it's as much as how much curb you take there now, it's the angle at which you hit it. And if yeah. you can get it straighter and land straight, you're fine. The, Ricky's problem was he was slightly still turning yeah. left as he yeah. landed. You don't want the car that far off the ground. That was no. way off the ground, wasn't but it? Was I mean, arguably, I think the 31 was further off the ground when it had hit its it? moment yeah, earlier yeah. on, but it seemed to just land and it deal with better. it far better. Yeah. Uh, I think but it was I'm a little straighter. With the, with the crash structure of the front of that car, because the crash box, the nose cone, is all completely intact. That's where all the really strong carbon fibre is. Ricky has been picked up by the ambulance. We don't read anything into that. That's standard operational practice. There will be no more running. Yeah, he opted in. Yeah, he walked in. He, no, he got out. No, no problem. Drums. And therefore, Ollie Jarvis once again mm. is the king of Daytona. Yeah, and surprisingly for me, the, the lap record uh, stands. Uh, although uh, since, yeah, the car hasn't really been slowed down, I don't think, since since the raw test. We've seen lap records in the uh, both of the GT GT categories, but not, I'd say, surprisingly to me, in DPI. The two so push laps. The two fast laps from Ollie Jarvis, 133.712, 133.711. Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? That's pretty consistent. The cleanup continues. We might have a little delay out on the track, but not for our pool sitters. In all the excitement, let's not forget that Ben Keating is a pool sitter. Ninth overall in the 52 power Matheson Orica for the pool position in P2. And that is a separate class. So that is a, uh, that is an earned pool position for Ben Keating, who is racing in two categories this weekend in the same race. Yeah. And that is his second pole because he won his first pole last year. Remember in the Mercedes and GTD, didn't he? So yeah, two different classes. Yeah, very cool. Very yeah. cool indeed. Excellent uh, job, by Ben Keating. Has already pushed his way down to the end of the pit lane, and this means we'll have to deploy both of our uh, Jamie's pit, with pit lane. Sorry, Shay, go ahead. I was going to say that Jamie's with Ben, and it looks like he's got his helmet off. Yes, Ben already has the off but before it was off he actually he stood here and he said you know that was just fun qualifying here around Daytona International Ben you're on pole to start the 24 hour what advantage does that give you as the driver with the confidence uh, you know realistically uh, I, I feel like the biggest advantage 
I, the, the only time I've ever won this race, it was from the very last place. So I don't feel like qualifying is a huge deal in a 24 hour race like this. But for the P2 class, it uh, it does give quite an advantage because I think at the beginning of the race, those uh, GTLM cars are right behind us. They're a little bit heavier. They get heat in their tires a little quicker. And uh, I feel like it's one of their main objectives to pass as many P2 cars to separate themselves from the cars behind them. So uh, being in front of the P2 class will give me a little bit uh, more room to uh, warm up my tires and get going. That will give him just a little bit of extra confidence as he will be racing in both the LMP2 category as well as the GTD category. Get some rest. Congratulations. Nice job, Ben. Thank you very much. Very excited about it. Holly Jarvis, it seems like 364 days ago we were standing here doing the same thing. Uh, another pole position, and you do have a Rolex on your wrist. I have to ask, is that the one from 2013? Yeah, I probably shouldn't be wearing it, actually. I forgot I had it on. <laughs> um, yeah, 2013 Sebring. I'd like to add to, co to the collection. Um, yeah, what a, what a car they just gave me. Cannot say thank you enough. Um, you know, this, this year feels different. This year feels business-like. You know, last year, huge amount of emotion, first time, you know. But this year, it feels like we've come here to do a job, and we've done it. And now this is just a very small part of what we want to achieve this weekend. Well, this is your fourth pole position, so you know how it's done at this point. Uh, John's saying, by the way, you didn't break your lap record from last year because you were wearing the Rolex. That clearly cost you a tenth out there. There's a few hundreds there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the track all day hasn't quite been where it was, at the, uh, particularly in the Raw. Um, I'm surprised. I thought, you know, had we have had a, a drop today had been dry all day, times would have definitely tumbled. We've got a new Michelin tires this year, slightly quicker. So, um, you know, it was definitely under threat, but, uh, you know, to be able to retain it and, okay, we didn't beat it, but I'm still, still got the lap record and, and put it on pole again for the whole team because they've had a really hard and tough off season. Um, you know, a lot of work's gone into to improving the car in terms of re reliability. So, um, you know, we're really optimistic ahead of the race. You're here to do a job. Step one is done. Good luck getting the rest of the way. That's a small part. Step two, slightly bigger. <laughs> Thank you. Great stuff, uh, Ollie. Uh, and uh, hello to the family back at home as well. Actually, I'm not sure if Chelsea's back at home. She might actually be here this weekend, but I know she tunes in uh, if uh, she can. So your boy done good. Uh, the Acura number seven looking a little the worse for wear there, JP, and that's going to be another long night. I, I, I wonder if that car, you know what? The crash structure looks, the nose box there looks very, very intact. That's what I said, yeah. My yeah, worry would be what's happened with the suspension yeah. and, and how far particularly yeah. the right front wheel has been pushed back in the structure. Uh, yeah, left front probably was, yes, it, I mean, it, it was a pretty much, it was a, it wasn't a glancing blow, let's no, put it that way. No, certainly not. I mean, thank goodness he didn't go off a couple of probably metres further al yeah. along, though, because that's bare concrete then. And thank goodness that, you know, there was three layers of tyres, which really did cushion the blow. It wasn't very far away, the front of the car, from actually connecting with the concrete, though. So much was that, that cushioning effect. But delighted to see that Ricky, first of all, well, the door was open for him, but thumbs <laughs> up to the, the corner workers straight away. And he did uh, sort of leap out of the car and into the rescue unit. But they'll be checking him over now for anything nasty like concussion, which could be a delayed effect. Uh, and just again, to make the point, Tom Davies has tweeted to say at IMSA Radio using the hashtags IMSA Radio R24 that the red and yellow flag was indeed out stationary on the entrance to the bus stop uh, and described there by Tom as the lack of adhesion flag. It is used for that, but it's also, it basically means there's something on the track that shouldn't be. It can be lack of adhesion. In this case, I'm pretty certain it was for debris. Mm. There was some debris in the middle of the track. Not significant enough for the session to be stopped, but certainly there was a, a little bit of carbon fibre debris. Well, we have our pole sitters, gentlemen, for the Rolex. Congratulations to Mazda and to Ollie Jarvis, to Nick Tandy heading a 1-2 for Porsche in GTLM. Ben Keating takes LMP2, and it was the FAF Porsche in GT Daytona. They have the headlines for now. Who gets the headlines on Sunday at about 20 minutes to 2 o'clock? Stay tuned to IMSA Radio and IMSA TV to find out the answers to all those questions. We'll be back with nighttime practice live from Daytona on IMSA Radio and IMSA TV.